Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is from Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. I don't need any butterflies up here. <laughs> so, good morning. Good morning. Oh. So, today I'm going to talk to you about a big concept. I'm going to ask the question who is this God that we serve? And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I had this, this like, this, this feeling that, that, that it was time for me to speak up here. You know, it was just, it was a, it was a seed that was put in me and I actually started, I started forming this, this uh, sermon outline in my head. And then four days later, Jerry comes to me and he goes, so what are you doing next Sabbath? <laughs> and so that's, you know, when, when, when the Holy Spirit lines things up like that, it's, uh, it's encouraging, you know, that you see that it, it's not us. These things we do, it's not, it's not of our power and uh, of our accord. It's, you know, it's, there's, there's a net work powered by the Spirit that draws us together in a similar course, in a similar direction, in a, in a harmony that, that we find throughout the entire world. So, so, so. is this on? Ooh, all right. So, I'm going to talk about perceptions. So, all of us have a unique perception of God. Our perception of God determines how we relate to him, how we relate to others, how we relate to ourselves. Our perception of God determines who we worship, and who we worship determines our destiny. So, okay, now... I don't like to speak for other people. You know, I don't know this guy. So, but we're told in scripture a little bit about him, how he got to where he is today. So, it says, sin began in heaven when Lucifer perceived God was restraining his potential. This perception was not of any reasonable origin. Lucifer was endowed with marvelous gifts. He was given a highly exalted position. He was given talents, intelligence, and beauty beyond our comprehension. He served at the very throne of God. His duty was his joy and his leadership the joy of others. Despite being highly exalted by God and adored by all, Lucifer constructed within himself a perception that God was holding him back. He entertained the idea that he was being cheated, that he alone was worthy of praise and worship given to the creator of the universe. Lucifer fostered, fostered disdain and jealousy within himself until it bore fruit. Then utilizing his position of influence, he began to distribute this perception to his fellows. With skillful subtlety, he sowed seeds of doubt in the minds of others. He promoted disdain to gain sympathy for his cause, and an untold number of angels followed his charge. The result was war in heaven. Aha. There it is. We lost the projector. Cool. All right. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Lucifer's perception spread until all in heaven had made up their minds about God. At which point, God eradicated sin from heaven by casting sinful angels out. Now, you may not be aware, but the universe is a big place. Our creator has untold orders of created beings inhabiting untold worlds that have existed for untold time. We don't know how long Lucifer served at the throne of the king of the universe. We do know that when God created this world, he did something special. 
He created a world inhabited with beings made like him. Earth was to be populated with beings made in the image or likeness of God himself. Foremost in this likeness is the ability to create life. And we have a beautiful example of that right back there. <laughs> Hi, Daniel. <laughs> I could preach an entire sermon how we were made in the likeness of God, but it is sufficient to say that an order of life mirroring the object of Lucifer's contempt would be the logical target of his assault. Woe is us. The war that began in heaven continues here. Lucifer, now known as the great adversary, continues his assault against the creator by sabotaging his creation. To Eve and Eden, Satan spreads the idea that he should be the rightful ruler of the universe. Okay. So now we're going to talk about Eve's perception of God. Sin enters the human race when Eve buys into the lie and, like Satan, judges God to be unfair. Deceived by the serpent, Eve perceived God was withholding her potential. Now, this is a familiar story, but we're going to read it again anyway. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Has God said, You shan't eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Yeah, we can eat of all the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, or you'll die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You're not really going to die. For God knows in the day you eat of it, then your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit, she ate it, and she also gave it to her husband, and he ate it. And guess what? The eyes of both of them were opened. Eve in Eden made a judgment about God when she believed God was restraining her potential. Has humanity's perception of God improved since then? When I sample offerings of popular religion today, I see many who claim to know God are foremost in pushing the ideas that he is fickle, arbitrary, irrational, inconsistent, sadistic, covert, weak, disinterested, disengaged, incapable, incompetent, lacking in wisdom and foresight, intolerant of scrutiny and delights in never any torment. You know, these men may not come right out and say, God is this, but when you listen to their message and, and they give their perceived character of God to you, you pick up on little things in it, and it's like, I don't think that's right. You know, I, I believe God has better character than that. So, but this, there's, you know. Outside of religion is a pervasive concept that we don't need a God, that moral, require, moral requirements restrain our potential and ultimately inhibit the progress of the human race. Many claim the eradication of the knowledge of God is key to societal advancement. Much like Satan in the Garden of Eden, they claim to possess intellectual superiority that comes from disobedience to the word of God. Open your eyes, they say. God is dead, they say. Now, they, they do not mean that God is deceased, I mean, the concept of God is a relic of history, a concept that is now dead. Except it's not, but that does little to dissuade their push. To them, it does not matter so much what you believe, so long as you don't believe in God. The good news is, these false perceptions of God will end. Sin on earth will end. Like the war in heaven, God will eradicate sin from earth by casting sinners out. Romans 6.16, 6, Know ye not that whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether under sin, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. And then Jesus, speaking of servants, says, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And he says, when this will happen, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So there's going to be an end. So what's your perception of God? You know, I, uh, I once joined a church group for a meal. We gathered around the table, and a young man was asked to have the blessing. He proceeded, God is good, 
God is neat. The food is getting cold. Good God, let's eat. Some of us laughed. Some of us glared. And uh, if I remember right, his sister just rolled her eyes. I'd like to think that somebody prayed for that young man, but regardless, in one moment, we all revealed our personal perception of God. Because how we interact with others reveals how we think about God. I've known lifelong Adventists who are well trained to honor God when speaking of Him or to Him, but they use their same tongue to spread criticism of God's servants. Only speaking accusations they believe to be true, they trust themselves to be righteous while actively despising others. You should know that when you criticize God's church, you are speaking of the object of his supreme regard. We can rise no higher than our perception of who we worship. If we esteem God to be critical of us, then we will certainly be critical of others. Ah, John 12. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. If any man hear my words and believes not, I do not judge him, for I did not come into the world but to save the world. He that rejects me and receives not, receives not my words has one who judges him. The word I have spoken, the same shall judge him the last day. Now this, this, this scripture is, is just loaded. All right, so Christ did not come in to judge the world. He says, the word that he has spoken will judge the world, right? So, but what's the word that he just spoke? <laughs> I've come in to save the world. So, if we reject the words of Christ, then that's our downfall. That's our undoing. So, you know, my brother once told me he's an atheist because he hates God. I mean, that's not what he actually said, but I'm not going to repeat what he actually said up here. But it displayed a glaring example of cognitive dissidence. And, uh, and I believe any false perception of God is a form of cognitive dissonance. And uh, for those who may not be privy, cognitive dissonance is the state of having inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, or attitudes, especially as relating to behavioral decisions and attitude changes. This stretches far and wide over our society. <laughs> the human race is steeped in cognitive dissonance. Inconsistent thoughts, beliefs, and attitudes pervade every aspect of our existence. This condition is a result of buying into Satan's agenda. Sinners are unreasonable. Sin and its consequences are unreasonable. To make sense of our world apart from God, we have no choice but to hold inconsistent beliefs. I've watched presentation by men whose entire thrust in life is to prove that God doesn't exist. They speak of science and theories about the origins of the universe and the life it contains while skillfully navigating glaring examples of cognitive dissonance. If God doesn't exist, then they are forced to conclude that the creation of the universe was governed by laws that created themselves and everything originated from nothing. A thinking person might say, how can these things be? You might follow this rabbit down the hole deeper and deeper, trying to understand until at last you arrive in a field of study called quantum physics where nothing is as it seems and space and time and matter and energy and all the forces of nature coalesce into a quagmire of interconnectability so perplexing that those who study things are foremost to assert that if you think you understand it, it's proof you do not. Quantum physics tells us that nothing that is observed is unaffected by the observer and by extension makes you the creator of all things. Similarly with geology and astronomy. These otherwise legitimate scientific disciplines are frequently hijacked as pillars of atheism. So-called ex experts portray scientific concepts as too difficult for you to understand but claim that they do understand and then they bid us to trust and follow them. Dig deep enough and you start to see the lines between science and religion blur. Quantum physics is used to support New Age philosophy. Geology is used to support Darwinism. Astronomy is used to support the Big Bang origin of the universe. These theories ultimately originated with the serpent in Eden. And uh, then they don't just stick around with secular society. Satan's cunning assault on his creator is so pervasive, in fact, that the facets of these theories are now nigh universal throughout Christendom. Most churches embrace a belief in the theory of evolution. 
They don't want to be out of harmony with secular science. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to stand up here and beat up on science or scientists. I love science. I have a great deal of respect for those who dedicate their lives in pursuit of knowledge. Science is not evil, nor is cognitive dissonance inherent in science. Rather, it is inherent in popular scientific theory, which is where we find the contrast between what we do know and what we try to prove apart from God. If you think the scientific world is blind to this fact, come talk to me after and I will share a conversation I had with a professor of geology. The intellectual coercion of the scientific community is astonishing. The great controversy between Christ and Satan is very much active in the lecture halls of higher education. Unless we start thinking highly of ourselves, I can assure you there is plenty of cognitive dissonance and Adventism as well. I'll leave that topic for another time, but we'll say I look forward to the day when I am no longer cognitively dissonant. Because when our God comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Check it out. Here it is. 1 John 3, 1, 2. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows us not, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we make known that when, we, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I look forward to that day. <laughs> I get tired of the contrasting beliefs and attitudes that swim in my head. I get tired of dealing with it when it swims around in other people's heads. But when he comes, all that's going to go away. We're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is. Our perception of God then will be true and pure. So in the meantime, we do what we can with what we've been given. God has promised to give us sufficient knowledge of himself. Aha, uh -huh. John 8, 31, 32. Then Jesus said unto those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall... Ah, yes. So, John also wrote about an angel's message. In the book of Revelation... Revelation 14, 6 and 7. So, God has seen to it that we have a knowledge of himself. We are told he will reveal himself to the entire world for everybody to make up their mind about God, and then the end will come. A final message is to go forth addressing the question of the ages and a special question for our time. Who is this God? Uh-huh. We just read it. We're going to read it again. Don't worry, you won't get tired of this. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Yahoo. All right. So John envisions sees an angel flying through the air with a declaration that the time of judgment has come. Who is making judgment? Is God making up his mind about us? This message is an entreaty to make up our minds about God. As we will see, our perception of God is our foundation of worship. Fear God. Glorify God. Worship God who made all things. So let's talk about fear. So... Those who know me know I love river rafting. Spending a week or three navigating a river canyon is an all-encompassing experience. The natural beauty, the camaraderie with my partners, meeting the challenges of the wilderness, the physical, mental, and spiritual invigoration, finding pleasure in simplicity, the food, the hikes, the rocks, the flora, the fauna, and the, the absence of human influence. I really love river rafting, but mostly it's about the river, okay? Oh, yes. Is that coming in? All right. This is hard to see. <laughs> so this is, all right, so there's the stern. 
the bow of the boat would be somewhere up here. So right in here, that is an 18-foot gear boat. So this is a standard operating equipment for the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River that flows through it. And so that right there, that is the hat of an oarsman who has found himself in the middle of one of the Grand Canyon's larger wallops, right? And so this wave is totally swamping his boat. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's terrifying, honestly. Yeah, so, but if you could see under his hat, you would see he's probably wearing that grin. Okay, because that's the grin I wear. <laughs> I love being on a river because I fear the river. Over the years, I've developed an understanding of the dynamics of moving water. His comprehension instills a respect and intrigue that is evident in nearly all experienced rafters. I cannot alter a river any more than a housefly can alter the course of a Mack truck. The river calls the shots. The river does not care who you are, where you've been, or what you know. The river is indifferent. It has the power to make you, break you, take you, and as I have personally experienced on a few occasions, rake you along the bottom. I don't belong at the bottom of a river. When I guide my raft into the roar of white water, everything in me, every shred of strength and skill is united in a common goal. Stay in the boat. There is an entire sermon there, but I digress. Uh -huh. Here's another shot. I love this one. Okay. So this is Lava Falls Rapid in the Grand Canyon. And uh, the Grand Canyon has a series of rapids that are uh, a formidable caliber as you forget, progress down 270 miles. And this, this is the pinnacle event, and it happens to be at the end. Out of all the rapids in the Grand Canyon, this one is rated a class 10. Right? And, and this, it, you can go left and get dashed on the rocks and wreck your boat. You can go down the middle and you meet this monster that they call Ledge Hole. And you just, you don't go there because you don't, no boat survives ledge hole. <laughs> so your only option is to go down the right-hand side of the river. And there's a series of standing waves that culminate into this hole here. And this is, this is called the V wave. And I wish this showed up a little better, but you know, it's, it, there's like eight feet of vertical water there that you, you drop down into this hole. The bottom of this hole is way down here. You drop in and you have to bust through this vertical. <laughs> I've, I've been there. <laughs> it's, it's an overwhelming experience. And so it, here we see again, this is an 18-foot gear boat. This is a large, heavy raft. And this guy, it's, you know, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just going to say that it looks like he's probably not going to come out of this okay. It looks like he's probably going to be swimming here in about half a second. <laughs> so... When you are in the midst of heavy white water, it is, if you'll pardon the pun, an immersive experience. Your mind is entirely consumed with what's before you. All you hear is the thunderous roar. All you see are towering waves, obscuring the canyon walls beyond. They stand tall and they break back onto themselves. You feel the shudder as your boat crashes into waves and waves crash onto you. You feel the wind and spray in your face. You smell the river. You taste the river. You know, this is why oarsmen are called guides. Oarsmen have little power to move the boat. It is the power of the river that moves you. You simply guide the boat and hope for the best. <laughs> Occasionally, despite your best efforts, the river has other plans. Waves may capsize your boat. Waves may flush you clean out. The result is the same. Suddenly, you find yourself swimming in maelstrom. Swimming heavy white water is an overwhelming experience. I mean, you know, statistically speaking, rafting a whitewater river is less dangerous than driving to the river, but that fact does nothing to quell the panic when you find yourself without a boat. Mm -hmm. To me, the most interesting part of this experience is the contrast between being in rapids in a boat and being in rapids as a swimmer. When you are ejected headlong into the midst of heavy whitewater, everything changes. The terrifying roar, the sunlit white water, the undulating G-forces are suddenly replaced with weightlessness, darkness, and muted silence. Sometimes the currents will grab you and push you deep, and you don't know which way's up. The water feels hard as it tears at your limbs, trying to rip off your clothes. 
And indeed, some swimmers come up wearing nothing but a life jacket and a grin. <laughs> Actually, you know, I made that last part up. They're, they're not wearing a grin. <laughs> the deeper you go, the darker it gets, and you begin to feel the pressure. Instinctually, you curl into a fetal position, hoping to not get dashed on boulders as you are tossed and twirled along the river, until suddenly the currents release their grip and your life vest thrusts you to the surface like a cork. I have experienced nothing that so effectively turns seconds to hours. I know it's not for everybody, but I love the river. Guiding a raft in white water is like a dance. It requires grace and connection, harmony, foresight, understanding. I fear the river, and that is why I love the river. On a river, you encounter a power that excludes opportunity to compare it with oneself, a power which banishes the thought that you are anything. Overwhelming power instills awe, respect, and reverence. To have a proper fear of the river, you must first experience the power. In like manner, you cannot fear God unless you also experience his power. So, you know, as, as I was gathering up my stuff this morning, I, I, I found this. I think, I think this is something you handed out a long time ago, Tom. And it, this, I brought this home, and it, it has stayed on the coffee table, the counter. It's hung out in the bathroom for a while, but it has never gone away. It just stays floating around my house because this, this is a, a jackpot of 40 verses that deal with fear. And so here we got this revelation, and this angel in Revelation is telling us to fear God. But at the same time, we read elsewhere in the Bible, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my, the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I, I especially like this one. You can see it's, I fold it and it just stays, stays right there. <laughs> He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the coronavirus that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you, for he commanded his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He calls upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. This, this is the same God that sent the angel with the message saying, fear God. So we need to understand that, that there's, God doesn't want us to be afraid of him. But when we have a, a just comprehension of what God has done for us and who he is, it instills within us a natural fear. So, you know, it, like the Bible, when, when I'm doing a river trip, I tell others to not be afraid of the river, but I also tell them that you had better fear the river. So, and uh, Jeb's not here. That's too bad. So, you know, it's, if, if you don't respect the river, you're going to find yourself in, in a situation worse than this. And, 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 and now this is the Grand Canyon. These are not rivers around here. So if I ever invite any of you on a trip around here, you, you, this is not what you're going to encounter. <laughs> okay. But it, when you put your boat into a place where it doesn't belong, you don't always get that boat back. The river has the power. Flip that boat and flip it and flip it and flip it. And it'll just keep it there and it'll keep flipping it. It ejects you. It ejects all your passengers. And it starts to rip your straps off and rip it open your hatches. And all of your gear that you need for two or three weeks in this wilderness canyon is now floating down the river. And there's a term for that. We call it a yard sale. <laughs> it, 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 you don't get that stuff back. You know, you need to have a proper fear of the river. 
So, Mr. Angel of Revelation 14, 7, who is this God that I should fear him? Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, Jesus says, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay, then. I agree with Christ. That is certainly a reason to fear. Much like Whitewater, I am nothing in the face of such power. But is that all? Like the river, where is the grace, the connection, the harmony, the foresight, and the understanding? Does the angel of Revelation 14 bring this context with him? Yes. It's in verse 6. We read it. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. The angel brings the everlasting gospel. That's the context of the fear. And that creates a perception change of what it means to fear God. This angelic message to fear God is accompanied by the work of God who came to give life and give it more abundantly. Christ says, it is because you are powerless that I extend my power to you. You know, it's often said God helps those who help themselves. But Christ says, no, it is because you are helpless that I have come to help you. Christ doesn't come to do what we can do ourselves. He comes to do that which we are powerless to do. With Christ, we are more than conquerors. With Christ, we become whole. With Christ, we live forever. Without Christ, we are destined to become nothing. This Christ, who accomplishes this work, he is our God. And so be it. Anybody with this much power and devotion to me is certainly worthy of my fear, love, and respect. But that's not all. John sees an angel flying high above the earth. This angel is carrying the everlasting gospel and cries out to fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Give him glory. <laughs> As human beings, we inherently glorify what we love. It is our nature. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What we glorify is the visible expression of our hidden devotion. When we love something, we speak of it. We gather with others of like mind. We study it and consume that which supports our devotion. We shun that which is contrary. We expend our time, resources, and energy to glorify that which we love. This is true for all devotions. Money, family, entertainment, politics, higher education, sensual indulgence, selfish pride, cars, selfish pride, selfish pride, cars, and even recreation, such as river rafting. Now, let me be clear. There is nothing wrong with glorifying good things. The issue is not what has a measure of your devotion, but rather what has your supreme devotion. When the object of your supreme devotion is Christ, the things of this world get strangely dim. This dimming is not some miracle. It's the natural effect of contrasting corruptible things with the brightness of an infinite God. Does God need our glorification? Is he lacking in glory? No. We glorify God for our benefit. Glorifying God and all that we think and do gives us a proper perception of God. Fear God. Give him glory. Once we've made up our minds about God, the angel bids us to worship. So who is this God that I should worship him? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the mighty counselor, our refuge and strength, Prince of peace, the great I am, the chief cornerstone, the Lamb of God, and many other titles, and Christ is worthy of them all. But there is one title that sets everything into perspective. Jesus Christ, sitting on the right hand of power, is first and foremost the creator. We're going back. <laughs> We're going to read it again. 
Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. This is the message to go forth to the world at the end. Creatorship is the special area of contention in the great controversy between Christ and Satan. The cognitive dissonance of the ages is told in the story of war in heaven, of a creature trying to replace his creator. The angel of Revelation calls us to worship the creator. To help calibrate our perception of this creator God, I'd like to share the most significant images ever captured by man. So let's shut these lights off. Has everybody heard of this? Here's a picture of that contraption. In 1990, this device was loaded into Space Shuttle Discovery and placed in low Earth orbit where, in a vacuum of space, it is free from the interference produced by our atmosphere. It is an optical telescope used to capture and collect light from distant objects. The images it produced had a profound impact on humanity's perception of who we are. So to test this thing out, we pointed it at what we thought was the darkest corner of the universe, and we opened the shutter, and we let it run for 10 days, and this is what we got back. This thing right here is a star in our Milky Way. And that's it. Every other spot on this photograph, these are galaxies beyond our galaxy. We had no idea. I mean, we knew there was galaxies out there, but we had no idea. So this image is called Deep Field One, and this is the raw image. The year was 1995 when we pointed Hubble into black empty space near the Big Dipper. Hubble focused on an area about 1 24 millionth of the whole sky which is equivalent in angular size to a tennis ball at a distance of 300 feet. For 10 consecutive days, Hubble collected light from the other side of the universe in an area of sky so small that you can obscure it by holding a grain of salt at arm's length. So when you're in potluck, I want you to get a grain of salt and I want you to hold it out there. That's, that is what... All right. <laughs> This, this overwhelms me. <laughs> Scientists believe light from the most distant objects has been traveling for 13 billion years, and I have no reason to doubt that. The Bible says, from everlasting to everlasting is our God. So, astonished by this, in, uh, this image, scientists turned Hubble towards Orion. And this time we collected light for four months. Oh, that's the wrong clicker. And this is what we got back. This is a 10 megabyte image of galaxies. There are 10,000 galaxies in this image. Each of these galaxies contains hundreds of thousands of millions of stars. This portion of sky can also be obscured by holding a grain of salt at arm's length and represents approximately 1 26th millionth of the sky. <laughs> this is the context of planet earth our recent creation is but a chapter in an ongoing saga a saga on pause while the universe watches a great controversy unfold the one who speaks galaxies into existence is the same who so loved this world that he gave himself to save it the same God who ordains the stars in their courses says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. This same God who created you to be like him, 
tells us he is moving his throne, the very capital of the universe, to planet Earth. And so shall he ever be with us. Friends, this is your God. <laughs> he speaks and this happens. Father, thank you for attending this message. Thank you for giving us understanding. Thank you for giving us a picture, just a small little picture of who you are. And this small little picture is more than we can comprehend and maybe, just maybe, starts to reveal what we can understand about an infinite God. Thank you so much for being here with us. We look forward to getting to know you and your creation throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It's an honor and a privilege that we're never gonna fully understand. Well, we look forward to your soon return. And we can see you how you are and be like you. Thank you so much for being here. Amen.